This is where we're going today. Right from the onset, I want you to understand that evolutionists don't have it all figured out. They don't have all their T's crossed and their I's dotted, but they pretend like they do. They preach like they do. They teach like they do. And many people think that they can trust the evolutionary scientists. I'm gonna give you nine reasons why these are not something you can take to the bank. First one, attributing exquisite design to chance formation. Attributing exquisite design to chance formation. Evolutionists will take something as incredibly complicated as the cell. Let's get simpler, as the mitochondria. Let's get even simpler, the Christi in the mitochondria. The mitochondria takes energetic electrons, passes them down through the electron transport chain, and creates energy in the form of ATP. How many of you remember this from high school science? Does this sound familiar? Yeah. yeah. What we know about in the electron transport chain is so complicated that what we know we couldn't put on a piece of paper. It would require half a book. Biochemistry, we see it, we can't replicate it. We can't really even see it. We just see what goes in and what comes out and we're guessing at what goes on in the middle. But there are specific proteins designed to hand this electron from one protein to the other, use the energy to create a bond with adenosine triphosphate out of adenosine diphosphate out of adenosine monophosphate. In order for this to happen, it is so complicated. And we're talking about individual electrons. Electrons are so tiny, we can't even see them one at a time. We have proton accelerators because we can, we can kind of handle a, a, an atomic particle that big. You don't ever hear of electron accelerators because they're too small. And yet, Inside every one of your cells, you have 20, 30, 50 mitochondria that do this amazing process of taking electrons and handing them down through a chain, extracting energy, plugging that into a molecule, then sending that molecule around the cell, and it's the ATP that does all the work. Way too complicated for us to understand, and it happened by accident, by chance? It just can't happen. It just, I know the analogy of finding a watch on the beach that works and that has numbers and keeps perfect time. I know evolutionists say, the cell's not a watch. No! It's like a billion times more complicated than a watch, and you don't just find watches being formed in the waves on the surf out on the outer banks. My point here, they attribute existing design to it just happened, okay? It just happened, it just happened. I can't even get a new set of tires on my car by just leaving the tires leaning up against it. Let's go to the next one. This is gonna be fun. Proving macroevolution with microevolutionary facts. It is a fact, it is a fact that things change over time. Bacteria can change over time. They literally can become antibiotic resistant. Have you heard that before? It's an amazing thing. You put a bunch of E. coli with an antibiotic and somehow amongst the billions of E. coli cells, one, two, five, all of a sudden don't get killed with a particular antibiotic. It's evolution. It's becoming a brontosaurus. No, it's not. The DNA, within the bacteria has a process of dealing with threats. And the bacteria comes up with a way to defend itself against the antibiotic. But here's the thing, you take that antibiotic away and that bacterium will go back to normal. This is not bacteria slowly becoming a brontosaurus. This is bacteria being bacteria and fighting to survive with the life force of a bacteria. That happens. But to say that that bacteria now is gonna become some crawling little creature, that's then gonna become some walking creature that comes out of the pond, to say that the bird's gonna become a mammal and the mammal's going to be, there is no evidence for macro evolution. There is lots of stories. I'm gonna tell you one in just a little bit about whales. There is no evidence. They'll look at this animal and this animal and this animal and they'll see that this one has a short nose, this one has a longer nose, and this one has a really long nose. Oh, those are evolutionary precursors. They use fossil records to make up these stories that they changed. 
from one to the next. When an evolutionist comes up and says, this turned into this turned it, the horse is one of the great examples, where they have all these horses that are lined up from smallest to biggest, as though they are, you know, this is the precursor, and then he got a little stronger, a little bigger, and they are taking a bunch of fossils, sorting them by size, and they're making a story. There is no evidence because nobody was there watching that horse evolve. There's no DNA that shows that this, and then this little piece of genetics was added and it became this. Evolution would like to tell you that they have all these pieces figured out. They don't at all, but they talk like they do. And that leaves people who are not really versed in science thinking something is true that's not. Number three, discarding lab tested evolutionary theory failures. They tried the generation of protochemicals, the chemicals that were made by lightning and thunder and carbon dioxide and acids in the primordial soup. They've done the experiment where they added all the things that were there at the very beginning, after the Big Bang and cooled down. They put it all in, they get the electrodes lightning and jumbling, they shake the stuff, they heat it up, they cool it down. They do all these things to try and recreate what supposedly happened at the beginning with chemogenesis. And I'm telling you, they get a few molecules bound together. What they're trying to do is create the first precursor molecules, some protein. What they get is just a soup of the same things they put in. They don't get the things that are necessary to create life. This has been repeated over and over and over again. The best scientists in the best labs without any interference, without any contamination. They have done the work. A group of Einsteins with their human intellect and their scientific skills, they haven't been able to do something that they say happened in a contaminated pond out on the surface of a planet. What I'm trying to say to you is that if the experiment doesn't prove what they want, they just push that experiment to the side and keep motoring because the philosophical basis of evolution is so strong. And if I can get me and seven of my friends all to agree and promote this evolutionary thought, who cares if it's true or not? We'll just save the day by our vibrato and by our stories. There are so many experiments that have tried to create evolutionary proof and they've all failed. Like mutagens, the idea is that evolution proceeds by mutation. So if you take something and you fire some x-rays on it, it'll mutate and maybe we'll come up with some new creatures. If you take fruit flies, Drosophila melanogaster, and you hit them with x-rays, you can get pink-eyed and white-eyed and crinkly wing and long wing and double winged. You can get all these different varieties and mutations. But at the end of the day, guess what you have a vial of? Fruit flies. Mutated fruit flies that most often die. But you never get a fruit fly plus. A fruit fly that's also got some new kind of ability. These experiments have been going on for hundreds of years by the most genetically adept scientists and they can't make intermediaries. You know, missing links. They can't make them. Next one. Are you having fun? This is fantastic. I love this stuff. I want you to be a little smug the next time an evolutionist is going on and on about it, or even one of your teachers or professors, or you're reading a book. I want you to have the ability to roll your eyes. I want you to be a little smug, not obnoxious. These scientists really believe what they're doing, and they're good scientists. They have just swallowed a world philosophy. Bottom line, if there is no God, Evolution's not a bad idea. If you take God out of the picture, a lot of the evolutionary teachings, next best thing, except for aliens. I think I would always go with the aliens. Disregarding requirements for fossils to be formed, deep, rapid burial. Deep, because if it's shallow, other animals will dig up the dead thing, eat it, distribute it, digest it. If it's shallow, oxygen will get it and it'll rot. And when things rot, they decompose and they're no longer a decent fossil. Deep, rapid. We can't let the dinosaur lay on the surface for two weeks. By the time two weeks is over, he will have swelled way up and burst and there's gonna be bones all scattered all over the place. Rapid, deep, 
burial. Burial is the only thing that will provide the heat and the pressure to go from an animal carcass to a fossil. We've been burying people for years. How far down do we bury them? Six feet. Is that deep enough to turn people into fossils? Doesn't work. You go digging in old, old burial sites, you will be lucky if you find pieces of bone, unless it's really dry. In order for fossil formation to happen, you have to have rapid, deep burial. How many fossils are forming today in our world? There may be some that happen when there's a massive mudslide and covers things up, or a volcano that literally dumps feet of ashes on animals. There may be some, but for the most part, fossils have not formed on a daily basis. As Christians, as believers in this book, we know about one fossil event that was worldwide, provided rapid deep burial of a multitude of creatures, all in a very short amount of time. An evolutionist will never admit this, but when you go to the fossil record, you don't find multiple layers of fossils. You find fossils in multiple layers. What do I mean? All buried by water. When you look at the fossils that you find, they are washed together, they're piled high and buried in layers of silt and sediment. Just the type of thing that water does. But water doesn't make fossils normally. On the bottom of a lake, if a fish floats down dead, it doesn't fossilize. Unless there's a landslide that dumps about 50 feet of dirt on top. Now it'll fossilize. What am I trying to say? If you're going to stick to the fossils and you're going to interpret them as the evidence shows, you're going to have to say, oh, these were formed in one chaotic water event where they were rapidly buried deeply. In the fossil record, you have to close your eyes, close your ears, hum a tune, and come up with some bizarre explanation other than the flood. I can give you all the information. I'm spouting truth as though I'm backed up with a thousand pounds of evidence. I'm not giving you the evidence right now because it would overwhelm you. What I'm telling you is you can go and get this evidence. Now, if you send an evolutionist off to explain this same stuff, He's going to be, well, it'd be kind of like hunting through the Bible for that verse that says that Sabbath was changed to Sunday. An evolutionist is going to give you his philosophy, but not be able to back it up with observable facts. They'll have a story. They'll have a storyline. Well, this herd of Triceratops were out in the plains of what is now Alberta. And as they were going along, a terrible storm came up and they all huddled in underneath the trees. But then some great lake, we don't know the name of the lake or why the lake was there, but it had to be a great lake, rushed down through the gully and washed them all into a valley and buried them deep in mud. They'll have a story, and the story has so many echoes of the flood. Can't be the flood. It's, these are just individual floods. Over how many years? Millions. The biggest reason for the millions of years is just to separate things out so that they aren't too much like what the book says. Number five, making up evolutionary sequences. Let's go to the next slide. I want to talk about whales. Yeah. Which one of those is a whale? The last one. You're pretty good at knowing what a whale looks like. That's excellent. This is the ancestral tree of a whale. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is the ancestral tree of a whale. The top one is land dwelling. Some say hoof. Some say it was a predator that decided that they needed to slowly change and go back to the ocean and it's gonna go there and eat krill. Because there's so much krill and not enough vegetation. Wait a second, there was an overabundance of vegetation. Oh, never mind. So he became the next one, and we only have so many bones of the next one. And then that one became the next one. I know it looks like a gator, but no, it's actually a former leaf-eating ungulate, meaning like a deer. And then that one found out that he really didn't need his legs a whole lot. 
So he kind of ditched the legs over several million years and eventually became a whale. And you can see what's left of those legs in the very back, let's go to the next slide, back end. Uh, let's skip this one. In the back end, you see those, the pelvis and hind limb? I want to demonstrate something of the absolute dishonesty of evolution. They call those bones back there the pelvis and the hind limb because it fits their story, not because that's what it is. In this whale, those bones back there are critical for the, if you have young children, just cover their heads. That's critical for the muscle attachment that allows the whale to get their equipment out for breeding. I did expect a few more chuckles. Yeah. You understand what I'm talking about? I mean, that equipment, you just don't want it out all the time. Do you know what temperature the water they swim in? No, you want to get out that, that equipment, get it out, use it, and put it away. You don't want to get that caught on the reef, if you know what I mean. A whale needs those bones. Those are muscle attachment bones for getting the equipment in and out. Were they ever a pelvis? Let's just take a look at what is. Never mind the fact that the, the whale, to do this incredible story, their nostrils have to move up their forehead and come out up above their eyes with muscles that close and open the vent to let air in and out. They also have to get some baleen to collect the krill and they have to have a taste for krill. All of this, it is critical that they're able to complete each step and survive. Now, make no mistake, you see that little tail? How important is it for a whale to have a tail? Remember, Megalodon is swimming in these same waters that these whales are gonna get their abundant food supply of krill. Taking that little tail and turning it into something the whale has, that's an evolutionary feat. What is my point? My point is you're gonna have to swallow some tall tails, some fish tails. If you're going to go with evolution, they make fun of the Christians saying, God just spoke and it happened. That sounds impossible. Even magicians, we know that there's some sleight of hand somewhere. What we can't explain doesn't become our handicap. It becomes something we can have confidence in. Because we sure know that it didn't just happen. I'm saying God did it. You're saying, oh, it just happened. Which one is more believable? It's, it's going to be a huge faith venture no matter what. Number six, I want you to have some robust knowledge in your backpack. You don't have to cower when the evolutionists come out with their tall tails. None of them were there to watch that whale evolve. All they're doing is they're taking these skeletons and they're lining them up to make it look like there is gradual changes. Here's another one. Ignoring the immense fossil fuel reserves. We have been pumping gas and oil out of the ground for years, burning it at a breathtaking speed. Coal, oil, crude. Where did all that come from? Where did all that come from that we have massive, massive reserves of fossil fuel, and as we search more places, we find out it's everywhere. Where did that fuel came from? It came from organisms, living creatures, carbon-based animals, plants, that got rapidly, deeply buried with a significant amount of heat. That's what changes it from fossils to fuel. It gets compressed 10 to 1 and formed into fuel. So in Pennsylvania, when we've got a 20-foot thick, 20-foot thick, sorry, 200-foot thick, 10 to 1. 200 foot thick seam of coal that runs across much of Pennsylvania. Do you know how big Pennsylvania is? I've driven across it a few times lately. It's big, 200 feet of coal. So that would have been 2,000 feet of vegetation and animals compressed down into 200 feet. Where do you get that amount of vegetation and organic material to create all that coal? And there's no seams of dirt between the coal. It's solid coal. That means it was all formed at the same time in one event. You can't just do that with a little flood here and there. And Pennsylvania is not the only place with coal. In Canada, we have the tar sands, which is an, a similar thing, crude oil mixed in sand. In Saudi Arabia, in Kuwait, in all these places, you have these vast reserves of oil that we've been pulling out of the ground for years, and there's still more. 
And then there's the reserves offshore. And then there's the reserves in the Gulf. And then there's the reserves Arctic. It is impossible to comprehend how much organic material is in the form of fossil fuel. To create it has to be rapid, deep burial, and one more thing, heat. There's only one event that would have created the fossil fuel reserves in our world. The flood. The flood explains so much, including the ice age. Yes, there was an ice age. It wasn't for billions of years. It was a short period of time. And it was right after the flood as a means of a hot planet depositing snow in the colder, colder regions and bringing the water level down. You know, Christians are scientists too. All of us are on the same ground, evolutionists and creationists. We see the results, we take the evidence, and we try to figure out what caused this. And you know what? Christians have better answers. Many of those answers we didn't come up with, they came out of here. This isn't a science textbook, but this is a science textbook. Let's look at number seven. The Cambrian explosion in the fossil record. At the lowest levels, there's the simplest creatures. Probably because they were easiestly buried at the flood. They couldn't swim, so they got buried at the bottom. Then it goes to little bit bigger creatures, little bit bigger creatures, little bit bigger creatures, and then, bam, there's like packed fossil beds where for feet you have layer after layer after layer after layer of animals, plants, sometimes with trees that were still standing and you've got, in evolutionary terms, like 50 million years and the tree grew up all the way through all 50 million years. <laughs> layer after layer after layer. The Cambrian explosion is when it seems like there was tiny little things that weren't really changing and then all of a sudden, the variety and number was blown off the stack. Just the type of thing you'd expect in a worldwide flood where a bunch of the animals were all killed in the flood and then they floated, bloated, and buried. Floated, bloated, buried. Have you heard of the plastic island in the middle of the Pacific? All this plastic that got blown together and there's like an island of plastic out there? Wind and water tend to sort things and put things of a similar variety together, which is exactly how we have fossil beds where you have huge number, huge variety of all these animals buried together. Evolutionarily, you can't explain that because you've got animals that apparently evolved from this one to this one and they're buried in overlapping layers. You can't do that because evolutionarily speaking, they're 50, 70 million years apart. You've got an animal that for 50 or 70 years was half buried and then the other one stood right there for a, another 20 million years so its feet could be buried while it continued to live and then gradually the layers just built up until it also died. And now you've got these two overlapping fossils of creatures that existed millions of years apart. It can't be. Someone needs to just say that is too hard to believe. It's too hard. It can't be. I know it's nice to have theories and it's nice to look for evidence for those theories, but when you come to things that do not support your theory, have the guts and the integrity to say, this doesn't fit our theory. Where would we be in medicine if the scientists that developed some medical treatments, if they acted like the evolutionists? Well, you know, it's killed 35 people so far, but I think we should still keep using this pill. I know everybody that we give it to, they're coughing and hacking up parts of lungs, but you know what? I'm just not ready to stop believing in this pill. And yet, I'm telling you that evolutionist integrity is below board. In the world of literature and textbooks, it's considered fact. No! Number eight, explaining away the lack of intermediary fossils. Missing links. Do I need to say anything? The evolutionary model is small incremental changes over time, wherein one organism can tr be transformed into a multitude of other organisms. The truth is, in the Cambrian explosion, we have them all. There are mi minor changes. You've heard of the Galapagos and Darwin's finch. Darwin's finches do not prove macroevolution. They do prove something else though, what is it? Adaptation, give me another word, microevolution. You started with a bird, a seed-eating bird, a finch, and you ended up, after a long period of time, with a finch. No lizard tail, no hair growing out of its nostrils, unlike most of us out here. I mean, I'm evolving. I'm starting to grow hair in my ears. Wonder what I'll become. Say nothing about the hair on the bottom of my back. It's exciting how we evolve as we get older. Number nine. 
ignoring multi-stage development requirement. Let's think of blood clotting. In order for your blood to clot, you have to have a cascade of reactions. How important is blood clotting? How long do you live without your blood clotting? If evolution is true, blood clotting was developed over time, where at first you somehow were able to have one of the blood clotting, and then after five generations, some reason you have the CoA and you have some fibrinogen. You need some hormones and you need some, it's so complicated, like 30 different things to be present in order. Platelets, there's another whole thing. Where do platelets come from? They have to be made and be present and come across the different blood clotting mechanisms and then all of a sudden, boom, we got a blood clot. So here's some evolutionary teaching. You only keep what you use. So way back in the first, the first thing, let's say the organism developed the platelets first. Develops platelets, starts making platelets. The blood is full of platelets. What do platelets do? Nothing to benefit the organism unless they're cut and you need a clot. So evolutionary thinking, the organism that developed these platelets is not gonna keep making platelets if they don't have a evolutionary advantage. In the evolutionary mind, the organism develops the platelets and the CoA and the other enzymes, fibrinogen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, gets all these things, and then finally they get the last piece of the puzzle and they get a clot. First thing, you're not going to keep all the precursors in place unless they're useful. You might make one of them, but then you're gonna stop making that one and make another one. What's the likelihood you're gonna have 25, 30 different molecules running around your blood at the same time in order for it to actually clot? Here's the other piece you've been thinking of. What about the poor little organism that has three of the 10 molecules in place? He's gonna try real hard in his offspring to produce the other five or six, but unfortunately on the way to get some water, he hits a little thorn bush, it pokes him, and he starts to bleed. That poor little organism does not have time to evolutionarily develop the other enzymes needed in order to clot that thing, and now that organism has to run around with one finger on his little bleeding spot in order to survive, but now Wolf sees him and says, hmm, there's easy pickings, and he, you have to have it all in order to survive. There's so much like this. Giraffes have to have a multi-stage valve system in order to keep them from passing out when they get up from drinking water or having their head blow up when they go down to drink water. It's happened to you when you stood up too fast. Can you imagine doing that 15 feet? Or your eyeballs. Do you know how many things have to be in place for your eyeballs to work? It's huge. Just the retina alone is so complex we can't even conceive it. The idea that multi-step evolution could happen is complete fiction. One of the simple ones they have is the bacterial flagellum. They say, oh, well, that just happened. First there was a little hair and then the hair got longer and hair got longer and hair got longer and it hooked up to a stator and it started spinning and the little bacteria was able to swim and get to food faster. Ha ha, voila, evolution. The only problem is there is like 30 different pieces that have to be put together in the right ratio, at the right connection, in the right orientation in order for that flagellum to work. And you're not gonna keep all those pieces. You're not gonna invest your bacteria budget in all those pieces unless they work. That's using evolutionary thought to test evolutionary conclusions. There's the list. That's a complete list. That's just the partial list of someone like me sitting down in five minutes. And there is so much more about the fossil record about organisms, about habitats, about niches, about ecology, about, we haven't even talked about astrophysics. Do you know the likelihood of a planet being in this Goldilocks zone that we live in? Do you know how unlikely that is? It's not just life. If you're gonna go without God, you have to explain a whole lot more than just where life came and how it became like this. You have to explain why this planet has the right components for life. If the Big Bang is the beginning of it, that doesn't let the evolutionists out of the closet because they've got to explain where the Big Bang came from. Don't just tell me some story about all the matter of the universe was condensed into a singularity. Oh yeah, yeah, right. Just grab a rock and try to squeeze it. Put it under a press and try to squeeze it. You can't put matter on top of each other. It doesn't happen. The Big Bang is a complete fairy story. There is so much. It would be my greatest privilege, honor, and joy 
If you have questions, if you want to dig in this further, if you have something that somebody has told you that really makes sense evolutionarily, bring it up. Let's talk it through. What I've done is I've picked on their weak spots. There are some evolutionary things that are really amazing, robust, and strong. I've picked at the weak spots just to show you that they don't have it all figured out. Let's all take a deep breath. <sighs> Do you know the very thing that we have air to breathe is remarkable? Plants, I can't leave this alone. Plants use carbon dioxide and make oxygen and food. Animals breathe in oxygen, I'm testing you guys, breathe out carbon dioxide and use up the energy molecules. So the plants and the animals are in this beautiful, self-sustaining, ongoing cycle where one produces what the other needs and uses what the other one produces. Who do you think builds cycles like that? That took some planning. That didn't just happen. You can't live on Mars because it doesn't have a system like that. Let's pray. Lord God, you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. I have no idea how you did it. I am in awe. I am in awe as I see what is. And my brain is screaming, someone made this. Someone designed this. I can't even look at a cell from my fingernail without knowing that you, God, are amazing, powerful, and good. And we just want to worship you today. May your name be the highest authority in our mind. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.